Welcome to Hartsville. Welcome to Prince Edward Island Worship. This is Ascension Sunday. It's one of the ancient festivals of the church. And uh, it's the day that we celebrate Jesus returning to the Father. And I think in most of our denominations today, this, um, this day can go by without even a mention. But you know, in the early church, it was a really big deal because they understood, they recognized that without Jesus ascending to the Father, there would be no church. His ascension paved the way for Pentecost, which of course is next week, and we will be celebrating Pentecost next week, so wear your red. Um, and this, this week we celebrate, though, that Jesus, who was fully human, is also fully God. He is our God of power. He is our God of love. He is our God who is with us always. His Spirit is with us wherever we are, in the middle of whatever we're going through. So today we celebrate that and we worship our God of love. Please join me in our call to worship. God of creation, we praise you. Lord of light, we glorify you. Spirit of comfort and guidance, we thank you. Our God of love, we worship you now and forever. Let us pray. God of glory and majesty, in Jesus you came to be with us, sharing all the ups and downs of life. Lord Jesus, you came as one of us, giving us a pattern for living, teaching us to love one another, to forgive as we've been forgiven. You suffered and died to show your love for us, and you rose to show that death is not the end. You ascended to be with the Father in glory, and by your Spirit you're with us always, calling us into new life and new opportunities. And Lord, we know all this, but we confess that we don't always live as if it's true. So today we've come to refocus our thoughts, to refocus our lives. We come knowing how much we need your hope, your leading, and your love. We come asking for forgiveness for the times when we've allowed our worries, fears, and lack of self-confidence to keep us from living the abundant life you offer us. Lord Jesus, forgive us for the times we don't always trust your love and leading. We come today to be renewed by your spirit so that we can live in your love, so that we can know your peace and joy, so that we can share your love and light with others and worship you in spirit and in truth. And so we come now and pray together as you taught us. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Believe the good news. In Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. We are set free to love and be loved. To love and be loved by God, by each other. We are blessed. Amen. Our scripture reading this morning is the story of the Ascension as found in Acts chapter 1, verses 1 through 11. Hear the word of the Lord. In my former book, Theophilus, I wrote about all that Jesus began to do and to teach until the day he was taken up to heaven after giving instructions through the Holy Spirit to the apostles he had chosen. After suffering, he presented himself to them and gave many convincing proofs that he was alive. He appeared to them over a period of 40 days and spoke about the kingdom of God. On one occasion, while he was eating with them, he gave them this command, Do not leave Jerusalem, 
but wait for the gift my father promised, which you have heard me speak about. For John baptized with water, but in a few days you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. Then they gathered round him and asked him, Lord, are you at this time going to restore the kingdom to Israel? He said to them, It is not for you to know the times or the dates the Father has set by his own authority, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. After he said this, he was taken up before their very eyes, and a cloud hid him from their sight. They were looking intently up into the sky as he was going, when suddenly two men dressed in white stood beside him. Men of Galilee, they said, why do you stand here looking up into the sky? This same Jesus, who has been taken from you into heaven, will come back in the same way you have seen him go. There was a popular song by the group R.E.M. Um, in the 1980s, I believe. It's the end of the world as we know it. And uh, recently with the, uh, the pandemic, apparently it's been getting a lot of airplay. Uh, people are relating to that idea. And it's even gone back onto the charts, apparently. So maybe that's, uh, it was in my head. But as I, as I read our scripture this morning, those are the, those are the thoughts that, that that tune was playing in my head. It's the end of the world as we know it. At the end of the scripture reading, we're, we're left with a picture of the disciples looking at each other with their mouths open. Jesus had left to be with the Father, and they were left all alone. And it certainly was the end of the world as they knew it, but they didn't feel fine. It was all more than they could take in. Everything that had gone on over the past three years or so, they were exhausted physically and mentally and emotionally. And now Jesus, who had been their anchor through all the turmoil, was gone. And he'd made it clear he would not be back. And it was the end of the world as they knew it. And you know, I can relate to those disciples. There are times when everything that we count on and take for granted is gone. And I've had people in our community tell me that they're feeling a little bit like that right now. We have lost so many people that we love in the past few months. And the normal ways of coming together and grieving and sharing support for each other aren't happening because of the pandemic. Our lives have changed. We have to take special care of our health and our safety. Even everyday things or what used to be everyday things like going to the grocery store or the pharmacy, they're different. We have to think about it. We have to wear a mask. We have to maybe stand in line outside. Things are beginning to open up and get back to a little more normal, but we still can't go to the dentist. We still can't hug our neighbors. We still can't come together in our buildings for worship. Who knows when we'll be able to get together again with our families off island. Physical distancing, masks, travel restrictions are gonna be with us for a while. It is the end of the world as we knew it, and it doesn't feel fine. So maybe we can all relate to the way those disciples were feeling that day. They'd been on a roller coaster ride with Jesus for three years now. There were times they'd been so full of hope, like that day when they'd come into Jerusalem to the cheers and waving palm branches. Was it only seven weeks ago? It seems like a lifetime. But of course, things went very rapidly downhill after that. There was growing opposition to Jesus from the religious authorities and even from the public. There was the shock of one of their own betraying Jesus. There was the horror of the arrest and the trial and the crucifixion, the fear that they'd be arrested. 
And then the unbelievable events of Easter morning, Jesus alive. He spoke with Mary and some of the other women. He walked with two disciples all the way to Emmaus. He met with the 11 disciples, in a lo or 10 of them rather, in a locked room that night. And over the next 40 days, he met with Thomas. He cooked breakfast for seven disciples who'd been out fishing all night. He appeared to 500 people in one place. He met with his half-brother James, who went from being a total skeptic to a follower and eventually one of the leaders in the church in Jerusalem. And finally, at the end of the 40 days, he invited the 11 to, to meet with him outside of Jerusalem. And they were excited and they were expectant because surely now was the time Jesus would act. Surely now was the time when God would free them from the Roman occupation and set up his kingdom on earth. And surely this was the time that Jesus would take back the throne of David and they were ready. They were so ready for this. And once again, things did not happen as they expected. When they asked, is this the time? Jesus told them it wasn't for them or for us for that matter. It wasn't for them to decide or even to know when God's timing was. And that the question they should have been asking wasn't, when will God do this? But what are we called to do now? And the answer for them that day was wait. Wait in Jerusalem for the coming of the Holy Spirit. Jesus promised that his spirit would come and teach them what they needed to know, that he would give them a mission and the power to fulfill it. But that was later. Now they were to wait. And then Jesus was gone. And the disciples were left feeling alone and abandoned. It was the end of the world as they knew it and they felt lost. Except, except with God, what seems like an ending is not an ending at all. What seems like an ending to us, for God is just the next step to a new beginning. Jesus' death on the cross seemed like a particularly cruel and permanent end to his ministry and his mission. But God used it to put death itself to end. Out of the death of Jesus came life, eternal life. And out of what seemed like an ending came a whole new beginning of God's ministry of love and life in the world. And Jesus' return to God at that Ascension Day seemed to the disciples to be the end of their relationship with him. But it allowed Jesus' spirit to come in a more powerful way, no longer confined to just one human being, but poured out on all his followers. Instead of experiencing God's power and love only through being close to Jesus, they were filled with God's power. And Jesus was with them always. God is in the business of turning endings into new and better beginnings. You know, one of the, the first Bible studies I ever attended um, was, was we studied Jesus' ascension. And we talked about endings and we talked about beginnings and we had talked about the importance of waiting and praying and trusting God. And there was lots of academic, can I say that, talk about what was going on. And lots of people had lots to say. But then Rita, an older woman who usually had very little to say and just listened, she spoke up quietly and she told us her story. And she said she was a young woman during the Depression and times were hard and they didn't have much and jobs were scarce. She was in love with Jack. 
and we all knew Jack. <laughs> well, Jack proposed to her, and when he did, he told her that as long as he had two hands, they wouldn't go hungry. He was strong, he was willing, and he'd look after her. And he was as good as his word, and he got jobs wherever he could. And if there was nothing local, he worked uh, building highways or in the woods, and that meant that sometimes he was away for weeks or even maybe months at a time. And it was hard for both of them. And some of the jobs he, quite frankly, hated doing. But he did it with love and provided for the family. Until he had an accident in the woods and badly damaged his left arm and hand. And while he was recovering, Rita took in laundry and ironing and went out to clean houses. And they hoped that he would, he would soon be back. To work. But the weeks and the months went by and his arm and his hand never healed properly. And he couldn't go back to the kind of work that he'd been doing. And there were no other jobs. And it was the end of the world as they knew it. And Rita said that at first they were angry with God because they'd always been faithful and they wondered how God could let this happen to them. The church rallied around they encouraged them and helped them and prayed for them and prayed with them. And finally, months later, on the recommendation of a friend from church, Jack was offered a job part-time in an office. And he'd never done office work before, but he would do anything. And he found that he loved the work. And he learned as much as he could, and he took correspondence courses. And in time, he started his own business, which became very successful. And he was able to provide for his family without having to travel. And their lives were so much better than they had ever imagined. Orita very quietly told her story and then ended by saying that they learned that closed doors and things that looked like endings were really God's opportunities to do something new and to do something better. We just needed to wait and trust and pray and then follow God's leading. Well, that first Ascension Day, the disciples returned to Jerusalem to tell the others what had happened. And they told them what Jesus had said to wait in Jerusalem. So they did, the 11 disciples and Mary and the other women and James and some of his brothers and Matthias and Justice and all of the other hundred or so followers waited and trusted and prayed. And those are none of them easy to do, are they? Not many people are good at waiting. Praying gets harder as the weeks and the months and the time goes by. Trusting isn't always easy, especially when we don't see anything happening. But these simple followers of Jesus supported each other and helped each other to carry on the waiting and the praying and the trusting. And God acted. At Pentecost, they were filled with power and everything changed. And they learned that when they face an ending, they can trust God to begin something new in their life, in the church, and in the world. So when doors close and we seem to be hitting a brick wall as individuals, as congregations, or as our family, when it seems like the end of the world as we know it, Jesus calls us to wait, to pray, to trust, to encourage one another, to build each other up in faith, and to look to him. And when we do that, we can face the end of the world as we know it. And we can, like the song says, feel fine. Because we know that it's not really the end, that God is doing something new and something well worth waiting for. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, when things are changing all around us, help us to be still, to pray and to trust. Help us to wait for and welcome the new thing you are doing and then respond in faith. Amen.
our prayer requests this week. We pray for people who are grieving and people living in nursing homes, especially those where there are no visitors allowed. We pray for those who are ill and those waiting for treatments or surgery. We pray for safety for health care and other essential workers and for wisdom for public health and political leaders. We pray for people worried about their jobs and their livelihoods, and we pray for our loved ones, ourselves, and those who've asked us to pray. And now let's take this time to offer to God not only our prayers, but our thanks and our praise for the blessings that are poured out for us every day. For Christ's love and peace, for new opportunities, for people who support us. Let's offer to God our talents and our love and the gifts of our tithes and our hands to build up the church in our area. Let's come to God in prayer. Generous God, we offer our gifts, asking that you use them to bring your hope and love, your peace and healing to those who need it most. We come offering our prayers of thanks and our prayers for your world and your people. Powerful God, we thank you that you draw us together in your love, even in times when we can't gather, gather together. Thank you that you break into our lives and free us from darkness and all the things that bring us down. Thank you that you take even seemingly dead-end situations and bring new hope, new life, and new possibilities. Lord, we give thanks for your gifts of light, healing, and love, and for the people who help to bring those gifts to us. God of peace, we pray for reconciliation and peace in places where misunderstandings hatred, and violence are happening. God of comfort, we pray for your healing. Comfort those who are grieving, we pray. Heal those who are sick. Bless those recovering from setbacks or failure. Encourage those who are discouraged or worn out. We pray for those who need your special care, for families and individuals who are going through challenging times, and we remember those who have asked for prayer. So, Lord, we come now in the silence to offer our praise, our thanks, our worries, our concerns, and our prayers for others. Lord, hear us. Lord, we thank you that you are God who hears and answers. Give us grace to be joyful followers of yours, to share your love in large and small ways, to be the people you call us and empower us to be. We pray in faith and we give you glory and praise for you are our God, one God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, now and forever. Amen. And now let us go out into this week. Let us live as the joyful people of God. And let us fear nothing, for our God is with us. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, who is our Heavenly Father, and the power and the comfort, the care and the leading of the Holy Spirit be with each of us this day and forever. Amen.